In part four of the unit four notes, we will be covering the quantum model of the atom. When passing light emitted from hydrogen atoms through a spectroscope, you get the pattern shown below. Why do you think only a few wavelengths are given off by the hydrogen? What else is wavelength related to? Now we know from our previous videos that wavelength is also related to energy and frequency. Now, if the hydrogen atom is only giving off specific colors here, or specific wavelengths, that means that it is only giving off specific energies. That means that the electron must be transferring between very specific places inside of the atom, which would give off just these energies and not the energies that are found in between. So that tells us something about the structure of the atom itself. In 1913, Niels Bohr proposed that hydrogen atom has only certain allowable energy states. Moving between these states will result in the absorption and emission of a specific amount of energy. N equals 1 represents the ground state. So we can see here, this is the orbit that the electron would typically follow within the ground state, and then each ring going out from there would be a higher energy orbital. Over here, we see a number of different series which are related to where the electron is coming back down. So if an electron is going up to an excited state and returning back to the ground state, so n equals one, that is known as the Lyman series. The frequency here would be within the ultraviolet. The Balmer series is where electrons are excited, but then they return back to n equals two. This would give off energy within the visible light part of the electromagnetic spectrum. If the electron returns to n equals 3, that is known as the passion series, which is in the near infrared. We also have the bracket and the p-fun series. Electrons can only move around the nucleus at certain distances, corresponding to energy. This is similar to climbing a ladder. You can pass through but cannot stand in the space between the rungs. Unlike a ladder, the spacing between the rungs is not even. So you can see from our diagram here, here we have a traditional ladder, and here you have a ladder where the rungs are not evenly spaced out. So they get closer together as you get further towards the top. And that is more similar to how the atom is set up. German physicist Werner Heisenberg showed that it is impossible to take any measurement of an object without disturbing it. This led to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which states that it is impossible to know both the velocity and position of a particle at the same time. The detection of an electron would be made through its interaction with photons of light. Since photons and electrons have nearly the same energy, any attempt to locate an electron with a photon will knock the electron off of its original course. You can think of this as a similar to an analogy with a mouse within a dark house. If you flip on the light switch and startle the mouse, you are going to change its location. For our next checkpoint question, if you shine a light on a ball, it will not move. Why do you think Heisenberg's uncertainty principle does not apply to the ball? Now, obviously physics works very different on the quantum scale as opposed to what we are considering on the macro scale. Here, as we are shining the light on the ball, it is not providing enough energy to actually move it due to the mass of the ball. The mass of a subatomic particle, such as an electron, is very different, and the electron would be moved by the photons that are interacting with it. We do not have to worry about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle with large everyday objects because of their mass. If you are looking for something with a flashlight, the photons coming from the flashlight are not capable of providing enough energy for the object to actually move. Here you can see uh, the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle in action. So we have the photons coming in and interacting with the electron. The electron was originally on this course right here, but by interacting with the photons, it is now going to have a new path and velocity. In 1926, Austrian physicist Erwin Schrödinger used the wave-particle duality of the electron to develop and solve an equation that described the behavior of the electron in a hydrogen atom. This led to the quantum model of the atom, or the electron cloud model. An electron cloud has variable densities, with higher densities corresponding to a higher probability of an electron being found there. 
In this model, energy levels are not neat like orbits around a nucleus like what we saw with the Bohr model. So you can see here how the electrons are just kind of a cloud of probable potential that are surrounding the nucleus. Here we can see a summary of each of the models that we have looked at so far. So we have John Dalton's sphere model. This is when we did not know about any subatomic particles. So we believe the atom was the smallest piece of matter. After the discovery of the electron from J.J. Thompson, we had the Plum Pudding model, where we believe that the entire atom was a massive positive charge with little negative electrons spread throughout it. The nuclear or Rutherford model was created after Rutherford discovered the positive nucleus. So all of the mass of the atom, or at least most of it, is condensed within a very small positive space called the nucleus with the electrons orbiting somewhere outside of it. The planetary model was a refinement of that by Niels Bohr, where the electrons were in specific shells or specific energy levels. Another revision to that is the new cloud model where we can't find the exact location of an electron, but we do, do know the probable location of it, which is based on this cloud, which is shown here. For our next checkpoint question, I would like you to draw the five models of the atom within your notebook, and they'll be very similar to what you just saw on the previous slide. First up, we have Dalton's model. For Dalton's model, you can just draw it as a circle or a shaded in circle signifying that there is no subatomic particles which are making it up. Next up, you would have J.J. Thompson with the Plum Pudding model. For that model, you would have a big positive charge throughout the entire atom, which is often shown by a giant plus sign. You would then have the little negative electrons that are spread evenly throughout the entire atom, like that. So that's J.J. Thompson's Plum Pudding model. Next up, you would have Rutherford's model. The main difference between Rutherford and J.J. Thompson's model is that the protons are now found in the nucleus at the very center. So there is no positive charge through the entire atom. It is all condensed to the very center. And then electrons will be somewhere outside of that, which could be shown like this. For the Bohr or the planetary model, you should have your positive nucleus, and then you should have rings of electrons that are going out from there. So from here, you could draw your dots going around based on whatever element you happen to be discussing. And then finally, we have Schrodinger's model or the cloud model. And for that one, you are still going to have a positive nucleus, but then you are going to have a cloud of electrons somewhere outside of that. So you can kind of have that shaded in as some kind of cloud of potential where the electrons could potentially be with a positive charge in the center. That concludes part four of the unit four notes. When we come back for part five, we are going to be looking at quantum numbers.